Matt here at St. James. And before we get started, we had a couple quick announcements we want to go over with y'all. If you're not already in a Wesley small group, there's a few spots left. So uh, please go on to our website at sjumc.org uh, and click on the sign up now tab and you can sign up to be a part of the Wesley small group. This is a great way to stay in community with one another, especially during these times where we can feel isolated and alone. This is a great way that we can just stay in community with each other. Um, we wanted to remind all of our trustees that there's a meeting going on this Tuesday the 13th at 6.30, so if you're part of our trustees, please plan on attending that. Um, and then we also wanted to remind everybody about the fall service day that's coming up this Saturday from 8 to noon. Um, we'll be doing a lot of planting, so make sure that you bring shovels, picks, wheelbarrows, gloves, everything, so that we can uh, spruce up our grounds. Um, and we also wanted to remind everybody about our Wednesday night Bible study that's going on. We're continuing that through the book of Acts. So if you can't come out and join us in the fellowship hall, there is, um, we are having a link to watch that via Zoom. So please come out, uh, come out and join us at this time. This is, uh, I'm going to read from 1 Chronicles 29 and 9. Then the people rejoiced because they had given willingly. For with a whole heart they had offered freely to the Lord. I encourage you to give willingly and to offer freely your prayers, presents, gifts, and service. You are giving them through St. James, but you are giving them to the Lord. So I want to pray um, David's blessing to the Lord, his praise in the sight of all the assembly, and it's from 1 Chronicles 29, verses 10 through 13. But before I do, let me just remind you, I think most of you know you can give. We have an offering basket in the back. You can give online at sjumc.org, or you can mail a check to the church office. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Let's pray. May you be praised, Lord God of our Father Israel, from eternity to eternity. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the splendor and the majesty. For everything in the heavens and on earth belongs to you. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all. Riches and honor come from you, and you are ruler of everything. Power and might are in your hand, and it is in your hand to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we give you thanks and praise in your glorious name. Amen. Good morning. If we haven't met yet, my name is Emily, and I'm one of the youth interns here at St. James. Um, I'm going to read a verse for us this morning, so if you will please stand for the reading of God's word. This is um, Psalm 62, verses 1 and 2. Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from Him. Truly He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. This is the word of God for the people. Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we may not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the mind is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Okay, thank you so much, Lamerle. Thank you, Praise Band. And uh, it's wonderful to have one of your students from Prince to join us this morning. Thank you. Your music was, was gorgeous. Very, very beautiful. Well, I hope your week has been good. Um, I can certainly say go dogs from last night. That was rather enjoyable. That's right. To, to see the see a good outcome here in Athens, GA. That's right. Dogs did not disappoint at all. All right. Hey, listen, wanted to just share something with you. At our 930 service this morning, um, we had a family to join our church. And they've been here for a while, but they were able to, to finally join today. They were actually supposed to have joined in March, March the 15th. But that was the day after the shutdown when the governor basically just uh, situated us with the, with the order or the shelter-in-place orders. And then we had to close the doors on that day of our church. It was just so weird as a pastor doing that because I'm always opening doors, not closing them like that. But we had to shut everybody out, obviously. Um, but they were going to join that Sunday, so we are able to reposition it for this Sunday. So at 9.30, uh, they joined us. It was um, Jared and Tracy Self and their daughter, Kirsten. Now, as I share about them, I announced them this morning as the Special K family because they actually have four daughters and their family, and they're really beautiful children, and their names are Kirsten, Kinsley, Kara, and Chrislyn. All beginning with K. Special K, right? And so Kinsley joined uh, through our youth group in the confirmation process a few weeks ago. She became a member of St. James. And so today, uh, her parents and her older sister, Kirsten, joined. So that's a note of praise. You will see us. um, We will send out an announcement about the selves joining. And if you know them, maybe just tag them. Send a text, uh, you know, welcoming them into the church family or phone call or whatever. Just let them um, know how much we are, how much we love them and how grateful we are that God inspired them to become members of St. James. All right, friends. Well, what I'm going to ask you to do is to open up your Bibles to Philippians. You don't need to stand for this, but I'm going to have my son James come and read this from Philippians chapter 2. Verse 9 through 10. If you were with us about three weeks ago, I began a sermon series on anxiety busters. And what I covered in that topic was was the idea about what is Jesus doing when you and I uh, are weighed down by all kinds of stressors and all kinds of uh, problems that induce anxiety in our lives? What is he doing? Well, The scripture says from Psalm 24, and that's what I shared on that day, that God would have us, as we live in his presence, he would have us do so with clean hands, pure heart, we would say no to idols, and we would instead would be frog people, people who fully rely on God. Frog people, all right? So I kind of covered that back then. But I really feel led um, to take the same scripture that I was um, sharing with you all on that day from the book of Deuteronomy and to touch on that and pursue this idea of what makes us anxious from a different angle and to see how God would have us react against it and what we can do in posturing ourselves aggressively against these forces that sometimes we feel like we can't control. So James now is going to come and read a verse, and you'll hear how it relates to this whole topic um, a little bit later on in the message. And uh, James is a junior at the Wesley Foundation, of course, over at UGA, and he is in the Encounter program over there, but um, he's learning a lot, uh, both at campus, but also through the ministry. So it's a thrill for me to have my oldest son participate with me today. So James... All right, Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every name should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Hmm. Now will you all join us in prayer as James leads us? Hey Jesus, I just thank you so much this morning for um, your spirit and just for the ability to come and... Um, have experiences with you um, this morning as we have. I pray that right now that you would just help us to rest, God, rest in your word and rest in your spirit, and you would just fill us with hope uh, through the message we're about to hear. 
and that um, whatever we're struggling with, whatever we're anxious about, God, um, that you would really just come and break those walls down and we would just surrender into your spirit and allow you to move and fight our battles, God. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, James. Appreciate that. Okay, so from Numbers 10.9, if you will flip over there in your scripture, I Numbers 10.9, I did say Deuteronomy a little bit earlier on, but Deuteronomy is next to, to Numbers. I've been in Deuteronomy this week, and I'll, I'll pull out something from that, but this says Numbers 10.9, I want you to go to first, and this is a scripture that I did land on about three weeks ago, and it says here, now these are what God's instructions to Moses are saying that whenever you have issues, whenever you have an army that's moving against you, here are the steps I want you to take. And so it says, when you go into battle in your own land against an enemy who is oppressing you, sound a blast on the trumpets. Now let's talk about how this relates to our lives. When you go into battle in your own land, that's in the land of your own life, against an enemy... Now, there's different kinds of enemies that we contend with on a daily basis. And I want to say this, this really is relevant now, especially in that we are in such a highly charged political season. You know, the, the election is less than a month away, and so it's on everybody's minds. And it is really easy when you see one of the talking heads on television, or you're talking with somebody that you really disagree with politically, and... You know, you're listening to what they say, and it's completely opposite of what you believe and know to be the truth. It can be really hard emotionally because you can just think like, man, you can see them as the problem and almost just try to like batter them down and, and teach them that your way is the right way and that you're thinking correct politically. And you can end up in your own heart without even realizing it, making them an enemy. I mean, this happens with anything. Or people that you see on television, depending on what your political persuasion is. You know, if you see folks on CNN sounding off or folks on Fox News harping about something, you know, and you don't agree with that, you can just become just so angry and upset, and they are the enemy. Well, we need to remember what Ephesians 6.12 says, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against who? So... God teaches us right here who the real enemy is, but against evil rulers of the unseen world. So what the Lord wants you and I to know is, is that your battle right now, the fight you're fighting is against Satan who blinds people rather than against the people who are blinded by Satan. Because essentially that's how we need to see them. Though they may be puppets, though they may be speaking things, you know, that, that are from the enemy, they're not the enemy. They are actually the targets of Jesus' love because Jesus wants to reach them and heal them. So, the scripture, when you go into, your, into battle in your own land against an enemy who is oppressing you, now, as a Christian, you can exhale on this one. Because if you've given your life to Jesus and Holy Spirit lives inside of you, you're a Christ uh, person, you're a Christ blood bought person, you belong to God, you're in the family of God, and you are owned by Jesus, you're not owned by the devil. So you cannot be possessed by Satan. But you can, as the scripture says here, when you go into battle in your own land against an enemy who is oppressing you, the day you were born, you had a target on your back. Because the enemy was declaring you to be his enemy. And ever since then, he's been oppressing you. He has in the past and he will in the future. So this is far more relevant than what you and I even realize. So yes, we are going to be oppressed by dark angels and other kinds of forces like anxiety, like discouragement, like whatever it may be. Now I like how the Lord begins in Numbers 10, 9. He says, when you go into battle, when? See, God doesn't say if. He's talking about 
when you do it. Now, here's what I think is the reality, is that a lot of times we let the enemy make us into a punching bag. And we live on defense. Whereas if you're feeling overly anxious about something, and, and then you finally get through it, guess what happens? There'll be another kind of situation that you can't figure out, that you can't solve, that you can't control, and you'll become anxious about that. Usually that's what we get most anxious about, is the things that we can't control. And so then you'll just simply change the situations, but the anxiety will always stay. So when you go into battle, what the Lord wants you to understand is, is that the day that Jesus walked into your life, he moved you on that day from defense to offense. So we're not to play defense any longer. We're not supposed to just simply absorb blows. We're not just simply supposed to take things as they are sent to us by the enemy in whatever form that it may be and just say like and coexist with it and just simply say, well, I guess this is the way it's always going to be until I get to heaven. No, that's the language of somebody who lives on defense. But somebody who lives on offense thinks a different way like Jesus wants us to think. See, Jesus wants to fill you with a holy intolerance against the stuff that wages war against your soul. He wants to give you a holy intolerance against anxiety or discouragement or doubt or fear so that you would say, I'm tired of this stuff and it's affected me in the past, but it's not going to rule me any longer. Because of Jesus. That's taking the offensive posture. I love what Deuteronomy 30, 27 says. It says, the eternal God is your refuge, and underneath your life are his everlasting arms. Then it says, the next verse, he, God, God will drive out your enemies before you, saying, pat them on the head. Be nice to them. Let them hang around a little bit longer. No, he doesn't say that. The scripture says here from from Deuteronomy, God will drive out your enemies before you saying, destroy them. You hear that? That's the language of a warrior. That's the language of a fighter, which Jesus is for you because he's fighting for your soul. And he's saying, don't tolerate this garbage any longer in your life. Be done with it. That's the first step, actually, for the turnaround. I'll give an example of what that looks like. It comes in many different forms, but I've got a buddy who's a plumber. Um, Sherry, you know who I'm talking about here. Um, But he's a plumber over in McDonough, and his dad was an alcoholic, and he became an alcoholic as well. And it was just tearing him up. And uh, eventually, you know, he got saved, gave his life to Christ, and Jesus filled him with, with such courage. He said, you know what, I'm done with this. I'm tired of this. I'm through with this alcoholism and how it is affecting and impacting me. And so now today, he goes over to Turning Point, which is AA. He goes to Alcoholics Anonymous three to four times a week. Now, this is a busy guy. He's a father. He's a husband. He's got a, a plumbing business that's highly in demand. People call all the time. But yet he sets a time, aside time in his schedule every single week, three or four periods out of the day to go to Turning Point, to Alcoholics Anonymous, so that he can be surrounded by people who will pray for him. See, he is putting himself in that kind of fighting position, saying, like, I'm not succumbing to this desire any longer. I'm not going to let it rule me and control me. I'm going to do something about it. See, that's to fight against it. Because I like what my son James said at the 930 service is, is that basically what this pandemic is doing for a lot of us is, it's exposing stuff in our life that God wants to highlight because he is bringing them out before us. That's what the pandemic has done, is expose things that otherwise we wouldn't be aware of. He's bringing them out before us, and he's saying, destroy them. Now, the destroying them, who's going to be destroyed, is never people, okay? They're not the enemy. We need to remember who the enemy is. 
It's against this stuff that fights against us, the anxiety, the discouragement, alcoholism, whatever it may be um, in your own life. And so God is sending you into a street fight. In his power, you are to go to war. And the first way that we do that is by starting to do what we did this morning. I love that song, the Merle, that you chose. Um, actually, both songs have been very, very powerful. I love Waymaker. Um, but I like the first song that we led with, Great Are You, Lord? Because in it, it said, it's your breath. You remember, um, in our lungs. Uh, forgive me for how I sing. But anyway, uh, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise to you only, God. You know, pouring out your praise. And so what you and I need to do is declare each day that we get up, each day that we're alive, start declaring God's glory. Start declaring His majesty. Speak it out. God, you're great. God, you're awesome. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in my lungs. See, that's the language of praise. And that's what you were doing when you were just singing a few minutes ago. Um, And that is what the Lord wants us, how He wants us to live. Because when our praises go up, His power comes down. And it starts changing things. You see that very clearly from the, the Old Testament, from Second Chronicles. Love the story about Jehoshaphat because he was going to battle against this massive I mean, army that you couldn't even count how many people were in. It was so big. And uh, on paper, he was dead. Mathematically, he had no chance whatsoever. And I love his military strategy that he put in play to defeat the enemy as it was coming against him. And he went out into battle. He he was doing what the scripture says, when you go into battle in your own land against an enemy who's oppressing you, when you go to battle, not if, but when. So he started going against them. And his his brilliant strategy was, was the tip of the spear that was going to inflict the greatest damage on the enemy army were the singers that he put at the front of the line. Because they just went to battle starting worshiping and praising God. Now, who does that militarily? Okay, I've I've never heard. I don't think Norman Schwarzkopf came up with that idea when he was, uh, you know, overseeing the American troops in the Gulf War. Um, Not sure that any other has, but but the Lord led him to do this. And so he just started praising God. The cool thing is, is that as the singers were just declaring how great God was, and the enemy was licking their chops. Then all of a sudden, God started. When the praises came, God moved. And God set ambushes against the forces that were coming against his people, just like he does in your life. He set ambushes, and all of a sudden, they started uh, teeing off on one another. They started destroying one another. The hilarious thing is, is that on that day, Jehoshaphat's not a single soldier of the Israelites had to raise a sword to come against an enemy sword. Not one time did an ally and an enemy sword clash because there was nobody left to fight. Those tens and tens of thousands were just wiped out. That's what God did, and it all began with praise. You know, when... When something invades your life, let's put a name on it, like, you know, you're just being ridden with anxiety. I spoke with, I've been speaking with people in our church who, because of the pandemic, has thrown us all off of our game, and they've been very, very anxious, and they don't, they can't control it. And so what God would have us do is notice the problem, but don't be absorbed by the problem. See, Jesus understands that if we hyper-focus upon something that we can't control, it'll control us. And that's why he said, seek first. He said, don't spend your time worrying. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all the things that you need will be given to you. So the way that God has it is, is that we should spend all of our time praising and none of our time worrying but we usually do the opposite. We spend all of our time worrying and then none of our time praising. 
Praise is the most powerful, underused weapon in the kingdom of God. Completely ignored by the body of Christ. Y'all, we blank out about praise. We come here, we do it on Sunday morning, but then we forget about it on Tuesday. We have something to come against us, and then we forget our incredible weapon of, forget this stuff. Jesus, I'm going to start praising you. I don't have an answer for this thing, but Jesus, you're greater. Just start praising. Start praising. And don't stop praising. Next thing that, that God will put before us is, is that as we're worshiping Him, as we're praying, great are you, Lord, you're the way maker, we need to then begin declaring what James did. Jesus Christ is Lord. Over this thing that I can't control that is inflicting me now with anxiety, Jesus is Lord over this. Just start saying it. Now, this prophecy from Philippians 2, 9 through 11, do you realize this is not just a prophecy that God the Father gave about what's going to happen at the end times? Because it says that every knee shall bow in heaven. That means up in the angelic realm, on earth and under the earth. On earth, that's us. At the end of the world, every person who has ever opposed God is still going to have to drop to the knee. They're going to have no choice. But they're going to drop to the knee and declare Jesus is Lord. And those under the earth, that means the, the dark angels, they're going to have to do the same thing. And God will enforce this, not just simply at the end of the world, but he'll enforce it now whenever he chooses And he does choose to do so. I was speaking with a, with a guy, um, and he gave me permission to share this. A guy who had been uh, sexually abused as a kid. And he had had some just spirits plaguing him through the years. And so he and I were praying about that in prayer ministry. And as we were doing so, the Lord gave me this rolling picture in my mind. And... What I saw was, was that um, during this time of prayer was that there were two, two primary demons that had been affecting him. It was a spirit of fear and a spirit of terror. Now, the terror spirit was the strong man. That was the, the larger, more intimidating force. And so the spirit of fear was kind of like his underling. Well, in this picture that, that the Holy Spirit gave me, I saw Jesus holding a sword against a fear spirit against his neck. And then Jesus looked over the much larger terror spirit at this point, and he said, at my name, bow. And there was this look of defiance on the face of the demon. And as Jesus said this, at my name, bow, I saw a larger group of angels that were on Jesus' right side. And then all of a sudden, I heard God the Father say from heaven, Jesus. When Father God said the name Jesus, instantly the angels hit their knees and they started worshiping Jesus. And that terror spirit, the one who was so defiant, Basically, this posture, I'm not going to ever say this. Here's what happened. This happened instantly. He was standing like this, and then all of a sudden, his shoulders were bam. That he was just arced over, and they hit the floor. It was like this, like an arch, but he was arched over. So feet on the floor, shoulders on the floor. And Jesus walks over to this spirit with a sword of righteousness and cuts it in half and it disintegrates. It's dead. Then Jesus goes over toward the lesser fear spirit. And all he does is he simply holds up his hand and instantly that demon was blown backwards into the abyss. Gone. It was that easy for Jesus to do it. And what triggered it all? 
at my name bow. And then Father God honored his son and enforced the prophecy. Jesus, you will bow before my king. And he made it happen. Y'all, when you say these words, these are not simply empty words that have no meaning. There is stuff that happens in the supernatural realm that is set off when you start declaring that Jesus is Lord. So do it and keep, keep doing it. When you invoke His name, it opens a door and Jesus walks through. The name of Jesus. So, um, next, let's talk about this. Weapons that God gives us. The weapon of praise. Don't let it stay on the, your coffee table at home just gathering dust, okay? Use praise every day. Declare that Jesus is Lord. Another thing that you and I need to do is, is that in the name of Jesus Christ, we need to take authority over whatever it is that's plaguing you. Doesn't matter. You put a name on it. You, if it's a disease, if it's an illness, whatever it may be. Now, I, I, I get it. I understand, medically speaking, some illnesses and diseases just simply are in our body and we're more susceptible to them. Okay? That's just the way that it goes. But I will also say that dark angels can also cause some of our problems. So, whatever the thing may be, though, we are to, to actually identify it by name and say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I take authority over this like anxiety, and you will not control me any longer. I forbid you from having influence over my life or over the lives of my family. So that's taking authority over it. And with all these steps that I'm um, outlining today, make sure that you say them out, speak them out verbally. Even if you're the only one in the room, say it verbally. The reason is, is because of Proverbs 18.21. Because the scripture says, your tongue, not just Nathan's or James's or Stephanie's, your tongue has the power of life or death. See, now that you're living on offense, you can actually speak death against whatever it is that plagues you, as long as it's not a person. Because remember, they're not the enemy. Okay, We're to bless those who hate us. Or to bless them, not curse them. Um, you remember what Jesus did when Jesus was looking for a symbol that would represent the nation of Israel when they had basically been living in apostasy and Jesus was wanted to teach them that, hey, judgment's going to come. You know, if you guys don't really start um, loving me in spirit and the truth and loving the Father who sent me. So Jesus went up and he said, okay, he saw a fig tree one day. He's like, all right, I, I got it. I got the object. So he goes up to a fig tree. His boys are watching him. And uh, basically Jesus puts a curse on it. May you bear fruit no more. The next day they walk by that fig tree. It was dead. In, the, in your tongue contains the power of life and death. So life for anxiety... Literally, I would say in the name of Jesus Christ, I, I take authority over you, and I, anxiety, I speak death against you. And then, in the opposite way, you start speaking life over yourself. Because in the tongue are the power of life and death. And so, whatever it is, let's say that it is something you're anxious about, you just start praying the opposite of that and say, Father God, would you fill me with your peace? This anxiety is robbing me of my peace. It's making me very, very nervous. Would you give me peace? Would you give me hope? Would you give me joy? See, that's speaking life. I receive your life. I receive your peace, Father. That's speaking life into your life. And when you do that, things happen. So let me give you an example of speaking life. Because in your tongue carry the power of life and death. James, would you come forward... Um, as I said, James does ministry over at the Wesley Foundation, um, and he was, he was with the group, I think like a group of three, and they were doing ministry via Zoom, just to kind of do some social distancing uh, and keep people safe, but uh, they were having like a Zoom call with somebody that they were ministering to by prayer, and uh, James had a couple different encounters with people 
in the prayer ministry. And so he's going to come and share that with us now. James, tell us about that. These are, um, these are situations where he was speaking life toward people. All right? All right, James. Hey, uh, yeah, so the other night I had the opportunity to um, just pray for people at Wesley through the encounter ministry that they do. And um, on that night I was praying for a girl and um, I felt like God put the image of my mind of her bending over and trying to feed a dove. And so I was asking God like what, um, what he had, what he was trying to tell her through that image. And I was just reminded of the story of Noah when um, he's in the boat and uh, a dove comes and flies and gives him an olive branch. And that olive branch symbolizes like God was going to restore the earth and the flood waters were going to recede and go down. Um, and so through that, God was trying to just tell her that um, he was bringing her into a place of restoration and new life and hope, even if um, right now um, it seemed like she was in a place where things were just like unstable or rocky or um, obviously during this pandemic, like many of us have had those times. And so he was just encouraging her through that word. Um, and giving her hope. And then I also had a, another image of um, a girl, a separate girl I was praying for, and I got the image of her blowing like a shofar, like uh, Mr. Jimmy has done here before, and uh, I was just praying, I was like, God, like, what do you have to give her through this word? And I was reminded of the story of Gideon, where um, they surround the Israel, or they surround the camp, all the Israelites do, and they um, break pots, and they have the torches, and they're blowing shofars, and whenever they did that, God released his spirit, and the enemy, uh, they all turned on each other, and they fought within their own camp, and their whole entire army was destroyed because of that. And so, even while Gideon was standing completely still, God fought his battles for him, and won the battle without him ever having to do anything. And so, um, through that image, God was just like saying to her, like, I'm going to fight your battles for you, and I'm with you in the midst of even impossible odds. And even when we can't see ways out through, like, pandemic, obviously, we don't know what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks or anything. But even through times of uncertainty, God is going to continue to fight our battles and win those for us because he has power over those things. And, and yeah, and what kind of effect did it have on her? Yeah, thank you. What kind, how did it make her feel? Um, she was just, like, really encouraged by it. And um, it's one of those things where you hear God... Um, like being like in your situation and speaking to her specifically. And she had actually said that she had been going back to um, the story of Gideon over and over again the previous months before that. So that was just a direct Fine. word into her life of God being like, I'm there with you and I'm fighting for you. Yeah. Thank you, James. All right. God bless you, son. Thank you. So, so you know, y'all, it, it, it's fun. Uh, doing this stuff, living this kind of way with God because he'll teach you. And he really does make it simple, just like for James. He just gave him a couple pictures in his mind, and he just start, simply just started telling them what he was seeing, what God was giving him. And then all of a sudden, like a clear answer came, and he shared it with them, and they felt encouraged. They felt hope. Both of those girls did. And see, they were hearing words of life. And that's what God speaks to you in the midst of your predicament right now or for people around you who are suffering in a way God is speaking life into these impossibilities that's what your God does Christ Jesus and, and so friends Jesus said as I wrap this up Jesus said that the gates of hell will not win and beat his church you are the church and thinking about gates, the idea is, is that gates hold. Gates are defensive. Gates hold things that they are trapping. And so God's saying, I'm on offense. I put you on offense, and I am sending you into battle. I'm sending you into a street fight against these things that have been teeing off on you for the longest time, and you are in my power not to tolerate them any longer because I'm going to win this thing. I am fighting for you, and I don't lose. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and God's awesome kids said, amen. All right, okay. All right, friends. 
let's, let's pray. So, Almighty God, you are good, you are wonderful, and I thank you, Lord. I pray for a surge as you are giving it right now for faith to fall on each person. For faith, God, just to move through them now, Lord, with supernatural power to believe you for more, God, to stand courageously against anything, God, that they feel defeated by in life. Fill them with your power so that, God, we can live and we never release the sword from our hand of praise. And it is in Christ that we pray these things. Amen. So James was talking at the 930 service about things that the pandemic has exposed. What is it exposed in your life? What are insecurities? What are these problems? God is saying, surrender them. Don't hold on to them. Surrender them. To him. So we're going to sing that now. Let's stand and worship Jesus. I'd like to introduce uh, St. James family. This is one of my students, Emma Allen. She's a senior this year. And um, she was part of the Estonia team in 2018. So if you ever wonder if sort of short term mission trips make a difference in someone's life, Emma is an example of that. She's very bold in her worship and her love for the Lord. So join us as we.